please give a warm welcome to our guest and fellow Yellow Jacket, Wick Mormon. Well, thank you, Mary. And uh, Mary for, uh, omitted to tell you that she actually has interned with our company for uh, a couple of years now. So it's great to see you here and some other Norfolk Southern folks around as well. Uh, and thanks for the introduction. And I am uh, delighted to be here. I thought uh, that I would come down. It's always a pleasure to come back to Georgia Tech. And uh, I thought I'd come down and try and chat today for a, a few minutes about some things that I think are important about not just our business, but any business, and important in terms of the way that you think about business. So for those of you expectant civil engineers who were thinking that we'd have a long conversation about civil engineering and the railroad, uh, we can do that later. This is going to be much more of a uh, business frame discussion, if you will. And the title I chose, because it's something we're thinking a lot about uh, these days, is our cu culture, our corporate culture. Uh, and part of that goes, in fact, to this saying, which I have half-joking, uh, that I, my goal is to shake every, every employee's hand at Norfolk Southern. And my best guess is I'm probably about a third of the way there. Uh, but we have a lot of folks out there. When I think about uh, corporate culture, uh, my personal uh, thinking about that has really evolved over a, l a long time now. Uh, I think you mentioned I began as a co-op with one of our predecessors, the Southern Railway. That was in 1970, that, which seems, I mean, unimaginably long ago, even to me. And to confirm for most of you who clearly weren't born in then, uh, back then. The Earth's crust, in fact, was still warm. And, um, and Georgia Tech students had to take something called drown proofing. And if you ever want to hear about that, uh, anyone of my vintage can tell you all about it. But I went to work for the railroad. Uh, I was uh, very fortunate. I was a kid who loved trains. And so my life story has been one of immense good fortune all the way through in, in almost every dimension, knock on wood. Uh, and I have obviously a, a wonderful job for a wonderful company today. But when you go to work for a company, uh, and really when it's the only company of any size that you've ever worked for, you don't really think that much about culture, the corporate culture. What is a corporate culture? And how do you define it? And how do you think about it? And in fact, I was having a conversation, this is a long time ago, about this whole subject when we were beginning to think more and more about it, about gee, what's our corporate culture at Norfolk Southern? And I said, you know, I really don't know. I could not tell you today what our corporate culture is. And this guy who was a consultant said, well, that's easy. We have a saying, it wasn't a fish who figured out there was water, right? It's just the environment you live in. But it turns out, and I've come to believe this more and more and more, that it's tremendously important in terms of the success particularly the success over a longer term of any, any corporation, any company, any enterprise of any size. And we have thought and thought more about it. My thinking has evolved on it. And what we have done is set out over a period of, I guess, seven or eight years now to very consciously think about who we are as a company and what our values are and how we go about talking about values and creating the right corporate culture. And what I want to do for just a couple of minutes is talk about that journey. And journey is one of the, I, by the way, and a lot of you, how many of you are in business, a business education program, right? Oh, that's it? Well, good, good. You'll get, you hear all this terrible gobbledygook, right? You start talking about synergistic integration, you know, just stuff. And let me just say this. If you're in a class and you hear that and your eyes glaze over, that's the appropriate response. <laughs> but it turns out that all of this stuff, some of, the, some of it that you pull out, is, is really important and real. And as I say, we have started down this journey, a word that is used way too much, uh, but in fact is somewhat accurate of thinking about and trying to evolve 
in our corporate culture. So let me go all the way back. If you worked for a railroad, it, it is uh, the, the railroad culture for many years, many, many years, was defined by the fact that we were uh, in, uh, often thought of after the military as the second great wave of organizations with far-flung and uh, geographically operations. And because of that, because we came after the military, it should come as no surprise to you that as the railroads really evolved and took off, was, which was in the middle of the 19th century and the late 19th century, a lot of the people who ran railroads were generals, were former generals. And in fact, we have row after row of portraits of all these generals on both sides who, who ran small railroads. And so a lot of the operations and a lot of the thinking behind them was driven by military thinking. And that's, that's not inappropriate because we're organizations that even today have to live by rules. We have to have very structured environments and we have to live by rules. Because if you don't live by rules and you don't follow the rules, extraordinarily bad things can happen. And I'll give you as an example the uh, Lac Megantic crude oil train derailment up in Canada, which killed 50-some people. It was just a terrible tragedy. And it's very clear that you had a case of someone not complying with the operating rules. So that's the stuff that can happen. So you have, you have an organization that was set up by the military and which you have to live by rules. You have to have discipline for those folks who don't follow the rules. In fact, you ultimately can't tolerate them in the organization. But at the same time, you have to have an environment and almost what I would call an esprit on the part of your people to get the work done because they, they are not, particularly in our operating division, and I came up in the operating division, they're not easy places to work all the time. The railroad is a 24-7 right, outdoor sport. We have 20-some thousand miles of operating railroad. Uh, it, think of it as 20,000 mile uh, assembly line out of doors. And we run you know, we run all the time in all kinds of conditions, and we expect a, a significant amount from the folks that work for us. And it's, it's a great business in that people who go to work for the railroad, in general, our theory is if you stay three years, you're going to make a career of it. And a lot of people stay because it's a very interesting business. It kind of sucks you in. It's, it's you know, there's a lot of activity. There's a lot of complexity. And you're out there doing stuff that's important that makes a difference for you know, the economy, for our country, as well as for our company. So we had a very, going back 10 years or so, we had a very performance-oriented organization, very, very focused on safety, and very much along the lines of, we expect compliance, we will watch for compliance, we do a lot of rules checks and rules tests, and we will run it in a very, very disciplined way. And that was our culture. And it did very well for us. Our company's been successful for a long, long time. Well, uh, I became CEO um, about seven and a half years ago. And when I became CEO, we, we kind of in a, started in a different direction. But we started to have a, a conversation about who we are and our value system and, and where we wanted the company to go as a senior, senior team. And out of that company, out of that conversation rather, came something called the Spirit Values, S-P-I-R-I-T. Safety, right? Performance, in, uh, integrity, respect, innovation, and teamwork. And we said, those, will be our, those are our core values. And I will tell you the inside story of this. We actually, we came up with these, these words and these initials. And I was looking at them. And I said, you know, if we had one more I, we could spell spirit. And uh, somebody said, well, what about innovation? You know, and I said, great. And that's how we got spirit values. They could have, <laughs> otherwise, I think that was a spree. And that just wasn't quite as good. And um, but so we, but but we started to promulgate them and try as hard as we could to promulgate them in a lot of different ways. Certainly by talking about them, certainly by trying to do everything that we could 
we, me, senior team, to, to walk that walk. And you'll hear a lot of phrases in business about uh, the shadow of a leader and, you know, uh, walking the talk and all of that. And, they're, and, and it turns out they're all true. You know, I will say parenthetically, I have a very strange job in the sense that I have become aware, I became aware very quickly, a lot of people watch me all the time. It's kind of unnerving, right? You know, but they do. They do. They just, you know, they watch what I do, they watch what I say, they watch where I go. And as a result, it's a great opportunity, right, in some ways, but it also is, as I say, somewhat unnerving. Um, but we started promulgating these values. We started promulgating them uh, out through uh, re re revising, redoing. It took, it's taken a long time, and it's still an imperfect process. Our whole performance appraisal process annually to incorporate, you know, incorporate some of these values into how we appraised people's uh, performance in the company. Started to doing some really uh, things that were countercultural. We started to say, you know, from now on, we're not going to promote the people who are necessarily, you know, the people who are getting the job done. End of end of sentence. We're going to promote the people who are getting the job done, who, but who embody the right values. And that was a change for us, because we in the past, particularly in the operating division which is about 85% of our company, would promote people who got a great job done. And you know the fact that there were extra shipments of body bags going out on a regular basis to them didn't matter. Didn't matter. So we started to change that. And so that all was rocking along, and it seemed to be good. And the chief operating officer, who uh, our chief operating officer, who's a guy named Mark Mannion, who is the hero of this story, by the way, and I, and we all thought, you know, we're we got this thing, this thing's going in the right direction. And, and to some extent, I think it was. But it, was, it turns out that while everyone in the company, you could walk up to anybody in our company, I think any, almost anyone, and say, tell me what the spirit values are, and they would have rattled them off, right? But they didn't, there were a lot of people who were saying, yeah, but you know, you're saying it, but that's not where we are. That's not what this company is really about. And this was born home to us in a very real way about two and a half years ago now. Uh, and as part of openness and part of all these things, I have a um, place on our website, something called Ask WIC, where anybody in the company can, I think we have, I, I think we have Twitter-like limits on the characters, a few more but, than 140. But anyway, anybody in the company can ask me any question they want. Right? And they send them in. Uh, I thought at first I'd, I might do a blog. I, I was persuaded that was a really bad idea. And, uh, and I, it would have been. Um, but we put this Ask Wick thing out. And our, so the first thought was, will anybody send a question in? Or will I get like 100 and then no more? Or what will happen? And it turns out, nope, they keep on coming all the time. Which is a really useful good thing because it kind of allows me to hear the voice of a lot of people. And most of the questions come from, uh, I said about 85% of our company is the operating division. Uh, it turns out about 85% of our company is also in a union. Uh, and most of the questions, most all the questions come from people uh, who are what we call agreement employees. And they range from, gee, can you help me do this as an individual to why on earth aren't isn't the company doing that, right? And to the extent that they're public and I come up with an answer, and we post the answers on the web page, and it's, it's all good, and people like it. Um, but I got an Ask WIC about safety. And I'll, I'll digress for a minute about safety in our company. We, uh, the railroads are inherently not a, a particularly friendly environment to work in. There's a lot of stuff out there that's, you know, heavy, hard to handle. We're out in all kinds of weather, all kinds of working environments, all kinds of footing, lots of moving equipment, right, all, all around you. And uh, it's, it, as I say, it's got a, inherently, it's got a lot of risk out there. And our company, many years ago, 25, 26 years ago now, uh, we were, you know, we were uh, having about five or six injuries 
per 200,000 report, what they call reportable injuries, and this is defined by the government, uh, of uh, so many injuries per 200,000 man hours. And that's, if you get out in the world and you start looking at statistics around safety and things like that, the, that's the accepted number with, of 200,000 man hours. And so we were rocking along at five or six, and we were occasionally winning the industry award for the safest workplace. And it called, was called the Harriman Gold Medal. And we, you, everybody kept track of statistics, and the end of every year, whoever had the safest big railroad won the Harriman Gold Medal. And our company went down a path about 25 or 26 years ago working with DuPont, who is kind of a, the gold standard of safety in a lot of industries. And we drove that number down around one, okay? And it just went steadily down. And the good news is that's a lot less, fewer people getting hurt, right, on our company. And the better news was all the other railroads saw it happening and followed us down in terms of the techniques and, uh, that we were using. But we won the Harriman Gold Medal for 24 consecutive years. Now, this is kind of, you know, Joe DiMaggio kind of territory. This was, I used to say that they retired the word unprecedented after 15 years. Nobody had ever won it for more than four in a row. We won the thing for 24. But it created a certain set of issues, and, I, and I'll talk about them in a second. Anyway, I get an ask quick from a guy, an agreement employee, he's a yard master in Asheville, North Carolina, and he says, have we ever thought about behavioral science, using behavioral science at Norfolk Southern to, to take us to the next step in terms of employee safety? And remember, we are totally focused on safety, right? Um, and I thought, well, I'm not aware of it. Uh, and I sent this email on to Mark Mannion, our chief operating officer, and he wasn't aware of it. And he said, let's, let's explore this. And we happen to know a firm, the name of the firm is Aubrey Daniels Incorporated, uh, through some other interactions. And we said, let's bring them in and let's talk about this and talk about our safety process. Well, we bring Aubrey Daniels in, and the first thing they say is, well, we, we'd be very interested in working with you, and we may be able to help you, but the first thing we've got to do is do a survey, do an employee survey to see what's really going on. Well, what's the downside? This is, this is not a trick question. What's the downside of doing an employee survey? You, you feel like you've got to do something about the results, right? You know, you don't want to just do it and say, oh, yeah, we saw that, but we, you know, we threw it away. So we kind of held our breath a little bit, Mark, and Mark said, let's do the survey. And we sent these folks out, and they did a lot of focus groups out in, with folks in the union, folks not in the union, all across the, all in the operating department, out at various locations, and um, did an online survey, focus groups, all that. And we got a notebook back with the results. And the notebook was this thick. And if I can sum it up, Essentially, it was a whole bunch of people, and the big message that came out of it was, we love our jobs, we really like the railroad, we're railroaders. People identify themselves, including me, as railroaders, but we think you guys have it totally wrong in terms of managing the company. Okay? And the interesting thing about it, it wasn't a lot of rants. It wasn't a lot of, you know, you morons, you know, blah, blah, blah. It was all about the way we treated people uh, and the way that they felt that they were valued and the way that we managed around things like safety. Um, and it was, it was really interesting. It was more than interesting. It was, it was more than interesting. Um, and so we had a conversation, Mark and I had a conversation about this thing, and keep in mind, this was 2011. We were on our way to record results, and we were on our way to our best safety year ever, okay? So it wasn't like we thought things were broken. And in fact, it would have been very, very easy to say, ah, bunch of malcontents, right? We just happened to get the wrong group. If we got in the other crowd, they would have said how great we are. Uh, and, uh, and Mark said, and I fully agreed and supported, he said, no, 
we're going to fix this. This is not the kind of company we want. And so we embarked on this journey, which we are now two some years into, of bringing these people in to talk about behavior and talk about behaviors across the company. And it's absolutely fascinating stuff because it's all, it's, it's, it's so easy, right? Or, not easy, I beg your pardon. It's so simple. It's all of the stuff that you learned in theory at your mother's knee, right? Positive reinforcement. When you see people doing good things, right, get out there and tell them. And don't just say, at a boy or at a girl or at a guy or whatever you want to say. Tell them specifically what it is. You did a great job of handling that switch. You know, I really like the way that you did this task, and here are the reasons why. And keep up with positive reinforcement. And when you see something wrong, correct it, but have a conversation about it as to why it's the wrong thing to do. And if you have issues and you have to use you know, discipline, you use it. You don't not handle things, but you focus on conversation, interaction with employees, and positive reinforcement, right? What they call R plus. I mean, right? How easy, how easy can it get, right? But it wasn't the one we, way we did business. I'll tell you, the interactions we had with folks were mostly, hey, why did you do that wrong? It was very rarely, thanks for doing a good job in doing X, Y, and Z, right? In fact, it was countercultural for a lot of us. Uh, so what did we do? Well, we hired up. We, we signed up with Aubrey Daniels. We have trained all of, our, in, all of our management in operations. And in fact, we saw the results were so encouraging, so positive, we're now doing it across all of Norfolk Southern. And we are now actually in the process of even put, sending our union employees to half-day training sessions. Now, how do we feel about it so far? We feel really, really, really good but the evidence is still anecdotal. But they're great. They're just hundreds and hundreds of great stories out there. You know, one of my favorites is we had a union local chairman, the local representative who's a conductor. And he was out on a crew, he and an engineer. And he, he had been known for having an attitude about things. In fact, I think he'd been dismissed once and came back. And we, 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 do, we, we do these rule checks with people out what the vernacular in the railroad business is in the bushes, right? Unannounced, watching people. And they were out on, a, we had a couple of, of employees and they were doing a rule check and they were watching this crew and they watched them at one location. They went down the railroad and they got to the next location and here comes this crew and this, this, this local chairman, this is in a long email he's writing to the division manager. And he says, you know, I saw them coming and I thought, oh no, what on earth are they gonna say? And they got up there and they started saying, you know, you did this at the last stop and that was, that was exactly the way you were supposed to do it. And they kind of went down the list of everything they, he'd done and told him why he had done well with it. And they got to one thing at the end and they said, now we noticed you did this and you know, this could really get you in trouble if you did it for the following reasons. And he wrote an email and, and the end, email ended up with him saying, you know, for the first time ever, and this guy's been out there a long time, I thought these people were trying to help me keep my job rather than get my job. And we're seeing a, you know, all kinds of this kind of thing. And we've moved away from what we call the gotcha mentality. So, so you know, as you do this, and we're two years into it, the first thing that everybody says is, well, gee, this is great, right? You know, and in Chattanooga Diesel Shop, there's a lot of that going on, and everybody's listening to, trying to listen to everybody about how's the best way to do this. But, you know, when you've got 100, we're 180 years old, you know, I was there early, uh, a lot of us were. And um, uh, so there's this enormous kind of, well, gee, this is better, but is this going to last? You know, show me how this is going to, how this is going to sustain itself. So there's a lot of skepticism that we have to overcome, some of which we have. Interestingly enough, the first thing we did, and it sent a very powerful message to the organization, and you can't 
discount the idea, these symbolic gestures, is the Aubrey Daniels people came back to us in the survey and they said, we could not find one person out there who had anything good to say about the Harriman Gold Medal, the safety award. And we kind of knew that. Mark and I both had talked about the fact that this thing had become a millstone around our neck. And I would get emails occasionally, isn't it true that you, me, personally, make more money if we win the Harriman Gold Medal? And there was this perception that we were doing it to win the award rather than to keep people safe. And so I called up my peers, the CEOs and of uh, the other big companies, and I said, you know, we just feel like this thing has outlived its usefulness, and we, are, we want out. We don't want to do it anymore. And interestingly enough, two of the three, within one minute, had said, we're completely there. And the third said, let me talk to one person, and, and he called me back right away and said, we're out too. And we shut the thing down after all these years. And that sent a really, really important signal to our employees that we were serious about safety and about doing things differently. Now, let me tell you kind of the downsides. One downside, which we were told, is expect your safety record to get a little worse. And in fact, it has. It hasn't gotten materially worse. And in most ways, major indicators, it's fine. But we had so much pressure on people about safety that we knew that we had things happening out there that weren't being reported. Weren't being reported by the employees that, to whom it happened, right? And we also knew that we, every year or two, we'd find a manager who was covering something up and had to deal with that. And we dealt with it every time, but people didn't see that. So we think safety gets even better from here forward, but It'll be a process. The second thing that's really the hardest thing is how do, you, how do I know five years from now that we're still doing this, that we have it ingrained in our culture? And the interesting thing is the ADI people have tools, just and very simple tools in terms of conversations and organized ways of thinking about and reporting on what you're doing in terms of positive reinforcement. And they seem to be very effective. And so kind of the bottom line on this culture stuff and trying to change the culture is usually where you want to go and the ways you want to get there are really simple, right? It's simple-minded stuff. This is not complex psychiatry, but it's not easy. In fact, it's really hard, and it takes a lot of work, and it takes a long time. But as you go out, all of you who are students here, and a lot of you will be entrepreneurs and hopefully start small organizations that get bigger, and a lot of you will go to work for big companies. It is, at the end of the day, other than the purely the fundamentals of the business, in my opinion, it's the single biggest determinant of who succeeds over the long term and who fails. So that's my simple parable for the day. OK? All right? I'm exhausted, but I'm more than willing to have a drink of water and take questions about anything that you would like to talk about. Or have I stunned you all into uh, submission? No, no applause required. All right, who wants to talk about civil engineering at the railroad? There's one back there. Thank you. By the way, and this is a guilty secret, I never practiced a day of civil engineering in my life. I got out. They wanted to hire civil engineers. That's how I got my co-op job. I went straight into a management program. It was very useful. It was great stuff. Uh -huh. uh, but I didn't, I didn't do any. Yeah, I Sorry. don't even remember what it is exactly. So yeah. this is not about civil engineering. I actually graduated from UT Knoxville. So I work at Georgia Pacific downtown. So how do you communicate to a manager or a leader that doesn't have a, a feed of response. Can you hear me? Uh, not, not completely. You work at, at GP downtown? Yeah. So, OK. And I'm not a civil engineer from tech, unfortunately. You're not a civil engineer? No, I'm It not. works out OK, though, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, so how do you communicate dissatisfaction in the way you've been treated by your manager that doesn't have a feed of emails coming in or tweets? Sometimes it's hard to have that discussion. 
um, but it's it's an important discussion. So you know, and it's a very it, it's it's a discussion that's fraught with peril, in some ways, right? Um, we t we uh, we actually early on, right before this started, we. We had a, taught a course to a lot of our, what I describe as lower mid-level managers called Crucial Conversations. And it was really a course for people to understand how to have a conversation with someone about di difficult issues. Um, oh, I thought you were agreeing with me or trying to hold me down or something. OK. Um, but. But those are, diff those are very difficult conversations to have. And um, the best thing, I, I always believe the best thing you can do if you ever have an issue with someone that works for you or that you work for is go, is go have that conversation and just say, you know, and you can always do it in a respectful way. And you have to kind of think through how they're going to respond to it. But I, I have never. There are people that just won't respond well to anything, but that's the minority of people. You go in and you just say, look, this is something I think is an issue, and I just want to have the conversation with you, and then lay out your issues in a factual, non-emotional basis and see where it goes. And that's all you can do, right? And they, but those conversations happen in a business like ours. They're happening all the time, all over. And what you hope, what I hope is that as this culture change is pushed down through the organization, it's allowing people to have those conversations in a very different way than they, than they were before. And it's also rewarding the people who are, cap or, or, who A, are good at their job, right, but are also seen as people who can have that kind of dialogue and lead employees rather than hit them with a stick to make them what they want to do. That's a really soft, vague answer. So. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks for coming to Georgia Tech today. It's always great to see a tech guy make it to the chairman, CEO level, of a large organization. I want to ask you about innovation. That was one of your uh, spirit values, I believe. And you talked a lot about safety and awards and, and sending safety programs. But what do you do to incent uh, innovation and risk taking at North Fork Center? Um, so there are two different things. Right. Uh, innovation is uh, there. Are, there are environments in which I think innovation, in some sense, is just more built into the working and environment. Now, I'll give you a great example of that in our company. We have uh, a large uh, or a significant number of locomotive maintenance facilities and car maintenance facilities uh, all across the railroad, and they are effectively shops. Of, of, and so in a shop environment, where, and we have a lot of people who go to work in those environments because that's, they like to work on those kinds of things. They like to work on equipment, right? I mean, you know, uh, you go to one of our shops and you look at, you know, the vehicles in the parking lot, and there are a lot of people who are mechanics by nature who go to work there. And I think that that's much more, if, if you allow it uh, and don't repress it, those, those folks are much more oriented towards figuring out a better way to do a process, right? So, and the, and the issue you have with people like, with shops like that is, how do you standardize work and how do you get innovation spread out across the railroad? But we have done a lot of work in thinking about innovation and it's a very difficult subject to foster. We have actually set up we had an innovation council, and we did a lot to promote people sending in their ideas. We've now taken that out and kind of made it more of a regional thing. Uh, and we, we try very hard to foster anyone who thinks they have a good idea, send it to us and let us take a look at it. We do not, and we've had a lot of debate about this, we don't give financial incentives for people to people with good ideas. And there's some argument that maybe we should, but I'm not, I think we've convinced ourselves that it doesn't, we don't think it would spur a whole lot more thinking. That most people, once they realize that we're open to thinking about a better way to do things, 
and willing to look at it, they're more than willing to offer their ideas. And in fact, I will tell you, we've gotten more good ideas since we started the culture change, the behavioral initiatives, than we did before, by a long shot, because they know, people know we're willing to listen. We actually have, you know, we've had groups of, uh, of like train crews, right, uh, or people in, you know, in the crafts, and they've gone out. We've had teams of people go out, and they've actually figured out how to improve customer service and reduce the overtime they get. But they see that as a win because the, the customer gets better service, and they understand the importance of that. And that's something we talk about all the time in our company is the importance of customer service. But it's a very difficult thing to foster, particularly in an old line organization, an innovative environment. And I think the best way ultimately is you foster an open environment. Risk taking is, is, is a different issue. Um, we, we are, we, you know, I have that conversation with people uh, on a fairly frequent basis about don't, you know, look, we are more than willing to take educated risks. Right? If we know what the potential is and we know what, where the potential problems are and we understand the magnitude of the risk and we think that it's a reasonable bet to take, we'll take that bet. Interestingly enough in our organization, I think because of our history and where we've been over the years, people don't necessarily believe that. And I think maybe that's true of a lot of interest, industries. But you know, I'm an example of someone that, that uh, I was put in charge of a, a, a little operation years ago that was a big corporate risk, and it didn't work out at all. I mean, I'm kind of, I tell people I'm the living embodiment of someone uh, in our corporation who took a, a good sized risk and it didn't work, but everybody knew what could happen, and it, in fact, the worst happened, and, you know, it worked out okay. So th they should take uh, heart from that. But, both are very difficult to deal with. And I think it goes hand in hand with culture at the end of the day. Well, you guys don't punish oh, no, 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 we don't. You know, eh, and people think we do, and we kind of keep saying, no, we didn't punish. You know, what? where do you get that, right? Now, we don't, we don't applaud stupidity, right? Uh, <laughs> I think that's a graceful way of saying that. But if somebody's taking a, 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 a risk, a smart risk, you know, and, and takes it with the knowledge of everybody else and it doesn't work, it doesn't work, that's fine. We got it, right? And we say, go try again. Yeah. Now, we, we, you know, uh, what are the, I forget, there's like five or six stages of a, you know, a project, and, and like number five is punishment of the innocent. Yeah. And, um, we try to stay away from that. Yeah. Sir. Sean Buchanan, executive MBA here at Georgia Tech. I was curious, with all the responsibilities of being a CEO, how do you possibly answer all those emails? If you allow really, 30,000 people to email I am, you. I am terribly slow. I will let them bunch up for like two months and then put a flood of them out. It, 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 you, now look, I didn't come here to be made feel made to feel guilty um, <laughs> and now I do but it's hard it's it, it, and but now there's some number of them that just go to someone and they take you know if, particularly if it's a personal issue they'll go to HR and they'll deal with it or something like that and uh, then I, I kind of let them bunch. I mean email is the curse of my life I you know I'm like well y'all all get a ton of, I get about a hundred a day and <sighs> I was just curious because I know that's, I think that's the problem with everybody here with all the emails. I'm like, how do you possibly well, answer all those emails? Well, as I say, I, there are two things about it. One is I let them bunch and I get answers in for, you know, because there, there are a lot of questions come in that I don't know the full answer or I draft something and I want people to look at it. But the other thing is to some extent is you do, you do what's important to you, right? And I do think at the end of the day, so even I'm not as good as I should be, these are important. And I get a lot of positive feedback out in the field, and I go out in the field as much as I can, saying we really like, and people say, I really like that Wix page thing. I learn a lot from it. And you get that kind of feedback, and you say, well, that's really important, and I'll go ahead and do it. Yeah. But yeah, email is just horrible. I, 
Hi, yes, Mr. Mormon. Uh, fourth year, Kemi, Shamir Mirza. I was wondering, you often see uh, core values as vague words listed on you know, a company's website. Yes. Have you seen spirit actually impact your organization as a set of core values, and how do you see it embodied in your organization? You know, um, you, you try to, you, let me answer that in a roundabout way. When, when, when you have the job that I have, right, you operate in a perpetual fog, right? You, it, it, you are insulated in a thousand ways from a lot of stuff, right? It gets very hazy very quickly. And I learned very early after getting this job that the one question that I would never get a straight answer to was how am I doing, right? Oh, you're doing great, right? You know, that's kind of the stock answer. It's not quite that bad. I do have people who will come in and tell me very politely that I'm, uh, I'm wrong. Um, but looking to see how it, how it is impacting the company, you, you have to look at really a lot of anecdotal evidence and then try and talk to as many people as you can. Um, I look upon, the, as I said, the values and the culture of the corporation. They're not something that makes a difference in, in a quarterly income statement, right? They're not necessarily even things that make a difference in one year. What you want for those values is, are the, the right attitudes and a culture that sustains you th over the long term of positivism. The other thing that you want out of the culture, and this is a big deal for us, and particularly talking with all of you, is you want to create a culture where people who come into it like to be there, right? And the people who work for you like to be there. I always say, you know, you are going to spend, if, if, if all of you really want to get depressed, go, go home this evening, go back, and compute how much of your life you're going to spend at work right? It's really kind of a sobering number, you know. And you might as well be happy. I mean, my career advice to all of you is go find something that makes you happy because life is way too short to get stuck in an environment where you're, where you're unhappy, where you don't feel fulfilled, where you're not working in a, in a place that mirrors your values, and you're not working with people you like, right? And that's a big part of this culture thing. And if you look at our company, we have 30,000 employees, give or take. A third of them weren't in our company seven years ago. So we have been going through, and we still have some to go, an enormous generational turnover, not only in our business, but in a lot of American business. And if you think about it, it makes sense. I was hired in the 1970s. That was the last great wave of hiring in the railroad business in the 80s and 90s, and really, to some extent, you know, up until 2000 was a time of consolidation and downsizing. So now we have this enormous generational turnover. And quite frankly, to attract folks like all of you, you know, to bring you in because you look at, you know, not many of you, most of you today, if they, if we went through, you know, the, the 1970 Georgia Tech curriculum and explained to you that you all had to take drown proofing, and that included getting thrown in a pool with your hands tied behind your back for 50 minutes, a lot of you might say, you know, there are other universities where I don't have to do that, right? <laughs> but you're all going to have a lot of great choices in terms of employment. And we want our culture to be the kind of place where you come and you say, you know, this is a, this is this is an interesting place to work. The work is good. I like the people. And I can have a career here. Right? Second to last question. A philosophy of leadership that uh, uh -oh. we <laughs> adhere to in our, in, in our program is um, the creation of a more just, caring, and sustainable uh, organization. And I'm convinced by your uh, talk about the just and caring that you're doing inwardly with your uh, employees. And then I was wondering about um, the extension of your culture to your other stakeholders and was 
pleasantly uh, informed by looking at the internet while uh, you were talking about your work with the um, National Fish and um, National Fish and Wildlife. Yeah, uh, yeah. For, you know, for your reserves, plus uh, the gifts the organization tends uh, to give to uh, causes in your uh, communities. So can you tell us a little bit about why you engage in those kinds of behaviors beyond, beyond your organizational boundaries? Well, let me say from a sustainable standpoint, right, if you look at us on a broad basis, uh, and uh, particularly from, and I have something of a penchant for uh, environmental causes. I'm on the Virginia Nature Conservancy Board and the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. So one reason we give to those causes is the CEO can direct corporate giving to some extent, and I'm unashamed about it. Um, but um, from an environmental and a sustainable standpoint, we, we kind of are the, we embody, you know, from a broad global sustainability perspective, we embody kind of the really good and the things you don't talk about so much, right? The really good is we're the people who take trucks off the highway. We are the people that move freight in a more sustainable basis than any other mode, right? One gallon of diesel fuel moves a ton of freight 480 miles and maybe up to 500. So it's a great news story. And a lot of environmental organizations really endorse <coughs> rail transportation as a result, right? That's really good, isn't it? That's terrific. 25% of our business is hauling coal. Not so good. Although it's really profitable and we personally love it. So. Uh, and, 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 our, and our excuse, other than it's really profitable, is we are what's called a common carrier. For those of you who don't know, there, there are laws that govern a com the common carrier. It's a common carrier statute. And because we're a common carrier, if a customer calls us up and says, I have a car of coal and I need for you to ship it, come get it, we can argue with them about the price, but we cannot refuse to go get it. Right? We, under the law, have to haul everything. That's not a big deal for coal, because we love coal, as I said. Uh, but it's a huge deal for us in hauling something like chlorine, right? Which is a, ter a, a really big risk for us. So, but to me, this whole issue of sustainability, you just, it kind of just goes hand in hand with everything else that you're trying to do. We, go th we, we cover 20 states, right? We go through all these communities. And it's incumbent upon us to be a good neighbor in those communities, and it's incumbent upon us as a big company, not only to give money away ourselves, but to encourage, bless you, a lot of giving on the part of our employees. So we have a big corporate matching program for gifts, and we encourage, you know, uh, I, was, I was slightly late today because I was at a United Way luncheon in, in Norfolk, you know, and, and we encourage our people to be active on boards of civic organizations and things like that. And that's just part, to me, that's just part of the deal, right, of being a big company is you need to do those things. That's part of, you know, the broader, you know, there's this, there's this whole kind of discussion which you can all have in business class about, you know, what is the role of a corporation, right? Well, the primary role is to reduce, produce returns for your shareholders, but there's a whole lot more out there and you've got to have some kind of balance until you know activists show up and then you say no our only mission in life is to produce returns for our shareholders and does that make sense yeah, okay yeah. yeah okay one last last very last good afternoon year. mr mormon um laura o'connell first year civil engineering student first year first year yeah first year i didn't hear the civil major. engineering excellent it's the path um. to the top i can just tell you. <laughs> let me say parenthetically I had a conversation with someone today at this lunch who was out working for Visa in San Francisco, but she got a civil engineering degree. And, it, and this was the father, and he said she got to something, he said she got to something called soils engineering, and she said, well, I don't really want to do this, and he said, that's fine, but you're going to finish your degree. But let me assure you, soils engineering I thought was a lot of fun. So when you get there, don't lose hope, okay? There's a <laughs> Thanks. Um, what's the biggest challenge that you face on a daily basis as a CEO, or what are um, some of the toughest choices that you feel you've had to make? I have a, let, let me tell you how I describe my job. 
I was, remember, I was a kid who loved trains. I have a fabulous job. And I was extraordinarily blessed and lucky to get it. And anyone who is a CEO of a major company who doesn't tell you right up front how they were extraordinarily fortunate to get there, they're not telling you everything. Because it's, you've got to be in the right time, at the right place, in the right age. And you've got to work hard, and you've got to do all that stuff. But, so I'm extraordinarily fortunate to have it. And most of the time, I have a great time. I'm having a great time now. I have a great time when I get out on the railroad and see all the folks, right, wherever, wherever they are. Uh, and uh, so 80, 90 percent of the time, I have, a, I, have, I have the world's best job. And then they pay me just hideous amounts of money to do it. Uh, untold, I mean, stupid money in some very real sense. Uh, and I cash the checks, and it all works out really well. Um, <laughs> And then 10 to 20% of the time, they don't pay me enough, right? But there's nothing systematically that I don't, I, I, that, you know, I just know every time I'm going to dread it or that's going to be particularly difficult or hard to do. It's hard, let me say, it's very hard to manage your time and to manage your life, right? And to make sure that you're paying attention not only to all of your responsibilities at the job, which are never ending, right? But paying attention to family and paying attention to things, to the, the other things that in, in a very real sense are, are more important. But you can lose sight of that very quickly. So that's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, there are things that I find less fun and interesting. I've had, uh, for those of you who, uh, a lot of, in the business world, you know, we re, you know, every company releases quarterly earnings, and then you have a lot of conversation with analysts. You know, I've I've been through thirty some quarters right now. I can't tell you I've enjoyed one of them, even good or bad. You know, either good or bad. And then there are moments of abject terror when your the business starts to go south very quickly or something like that. But that's not that's I don't think of my job that way as what's the hardest or most difficult thing to do. There are difficult decisions that come up. They don't come up every day, but the deal is you make them and you move forward, right? And nobody bats a thousand, but I'm, I am paid a lot of money to try to have a very high batting average. That's, that's the nature of it, you know? And the, the, the best, and the very best thing, and I'll end with this, the very best thing about my job and I'm not sure I do it very well all the time, but I try very hard to do, is that I am the person who represents all the great people at our company. And if I can go out and do that well, then I'm doing a pretty good job. Fair enough? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. That was the last question. Indeed. Right? Thanks, thank you everybody. very much. Wait.